I feel it this morning. And then secondly, the faith of Noah is seen in those who are willing to move with godly fear. Move with godly fear. Noah apparently feared God more than he feared the derision and the mocking of his neighbors. Noah apparently had enough respect for what God had said to him that every single day from early morning to late at night he was busy moved by a fear that if the ark was not built he would perish his wife would perish and his children would perish and it was that fear of God that moved him every day by faith Noah the scripture says being divinely warned of things not yet seen move with godly fear I pray today that God would return to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ a godly fear we need that desperately in our world. You're saying, Pastor Bob, that I should be afraid of God? Let me tell you, if not in the sense that you're afraid to talk to Him or be with Him as a believer, but yes, we need to have a reverence and a respect for God for who He is. Come on. How many of you realize that God is not your big buddy up in the sky? Hello? God is not a heavenly Santa Claus. He's not the man upstairs. Amen? I'll tell you who He is. He's the judge. He is God. He is all-powerful. He is almighty, and He needs to be respected. Hello? If you have a relationship with God and you're living and you're walking in obedience to His commands, you don't have to be afraid of Him. Come on, we are His sons and His daughters, but we do have to give Him reverence. We do have to have a respect for God. But many in the church world even have lost their, their fear of God. Can I remind you that the Scripture tells us this in Proverbs 9 and verse number 10. It says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to have wisdom. I, that, that's why Noah built the ark. He had wisdom because he feared the Lord and he was moved by that fear. You see, he, he determined, I'm not going to drown. I, I'm going to do what the Lord said. And when God created me and when he created you, he put within us a, 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 an instinct called self-preservation. Huh? It's a God-given instinct. And you know, some people say, you know, preacher... Pastor, you shouldn't use fear to motivate people. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody's motivated by fear. The doctors motivate us by fear. They'll tell you, you better lose some weight or you're going to have a heart attack. You need this surgery to save your life. The insurance people use fear to motivate us. They say you'd better have so much insurance or you'll be in an accident. They'll be able to take all that, everything that you have. And when you cross the road, I can guarantee you, what do you do? You look both ways. You want to know why? You don't want to get hit by an automobile. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just common plain sense. We're motivated by fear every day in hundreds of ways, except in the greatest way sometimes in the spiritual way. I want you to know, sir, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen, your greatest danger is not the danger of being hit by an automobile or having an automobile accident or having, an ar having a heart attack. You want to know what your greatest danger is? Listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Jesus said this in Matthew 10 and verse 28. He said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Body in hell. My friend, your greatest danger, the supreme danger, is not that you would, you know, have an accident, but my friend, one day, the, the greatest danger is that one day you would stand before God unprepared, unforgiven, and uncleansed. Come on, somebody. Let's move ourselves with holy fear. You've got to do what you've got to do to get right. Come on. You say, well, I need to see a counselor. Pull, put the money out. Go see a Christian counselor. Come on. There's celebrate recovery. There's so many different ways. Seek God every day. Cry out to the Lord. But let me tell you something. It's time we start being moved with the holy fear to get right. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. I tell you what. 
I don't want to be a pastor that plays around with the things of God. I don't want to be a pastor that's indifferent to spiritual things. Half-hearted, lukewarm. Let me tell you what I want to be. Red hot for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be on fire for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to, when I stand before the Lord Jesus, I want Him to say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Come on, is there anybody that says, I'm going to be moved with the holy fear? Amen. Oh man, I can preach today. Y'all, y'all keep praying like you've been doing. Uh, that brings the preacher. How I many know I'm not the uh, My prayer is that the preacher's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then the faith of Noah is seen in those who make preparation for themselves. And their family. I like this part. Hebrews 11 and verse number 7. It says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. What did he do? He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Now, it took Noah 120 years to build an ark. Is there anybody here that's glad that God didn't tell you you have to build an ark in order to be saved? You say, well, Pastor Bob, shouldn't we become all become preppers? <laughs> we'll raise money and, and build a giant underground bunker behind the church that will resist atom bombs, store food up in there. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Hello? I don't have to do that. Amen. In fact, let me tell you, I've got really good news for everybody. Jesus Christ built your ark. Did you hear what I said? He built your ark. You say, what did he make it out of? It just took two pieces of wood, a cross, amen. He built an ark, and he got up on that, on, that, on that cross, and he died for humanity. And now all he says is, look, all you've got to do is by faith walk into the ark and trust the Lord that he'll save you. Come on, somebody. Are you grateful for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? But there's got to be preparation made. Did you know that the coming of the Lord is one of the most common themes in Scripture? In the New Testament's 260 chapters, Christ's return is mentioned no less than 318 times. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. And we've got to make preparation. You say, well, what do I need to do? First of all, number one, you need to make Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord. Amen? Amen. You need to make Him your Savior and your Lord. John 1, 12 says, But to as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Jesus said you've got to be born again. I'm not talking about giving mental assent to God today and saying, oh yeah, there must be a higher power out there somewhere. I'm not talking about kind of tipping your hat to God. I'm not talking about walking forward in some church and shaking a preacher's hand somewhere and joining the church. Let me tell you something. Joining a church won't get you in. Hello? Amen. You say, well, I come to church. Let me tell you something. How many of you know you can go sit in a chicken house and it will not make you a chicken? Hello? What I'm saying is you've got to get born again. I don't know where that came from. That had to be a Facebook post somewhere. I don't know. But you've got to be born again. So when does that happen? It happens the moment you realize that there is no amount of good works that you can do. There's no amount of striving that you can do. No amount of trying harder. You know, some people say, well, I'll just turn over a new leaf. I'll change it, and that'll get me in. Let me tell you something. You've said that before, and it hasn't worked. Come on. I'm going to tell you something. The only hope that we have, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Come on. We've got to put our faith and our confidence in Him. And the most beautiful thing happens when that happens. You know what? We bring it to the grand exchange. We bring to Jesus all of our failures, all of our mess-ups, all of our sins. We bring Him all of our brokenness, and we put our faith in Him. And let me tell you what He does. He says, since you put your faith in me, I've got something I'm going to impute 
to you. It's called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. I'm just there to tell you, I'm grateful for Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And we need a godly sorrow over our sins. I'm going to tell you something. Crying won't get you in. I'm just saying, well, if I cry, that means I'm saying, really? Someone in the Bible, who was that? Esau sought God for rep- with tears. But there was no repentance. There's a difference between a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. A worldly sorrow says, I'm sorry I'm in this condition. I'm sorry, you know, I got caught. I'm sorry. I, but let me tell you, there's a godly sorrow that says, God, help me change. I'm going to change. And it leads to repentance. Amen? And how many of you know when Jesus comes in as Savior, He comes in as Lord? Yes, when He comes in as Savior, He walks in as the King, the Hefe, El Boss, whatever you want to say. Come on. He's God. He's the Lord. He's the King of your life. He's the Director of your life. Amen? And then secondly, you've got to be careful how you live. If you're a believer in Jesus, be careful how you live today. Luke 21 tells us this, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation. Dissipation is a wasting of your life. Your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Be careful how you live. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Oh, come on. Is there anybody that's going to escape what's going to happen? <laughs> you know, I'm going up. Amen. That you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. That carefulness is seen in our lives. Luke 12, verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master, when He comes, will find watching. Are you watching for the coming of the Lord? Are you looking for His appearance? When I was a little boy, they used to have the flannel graph. How many remember that in Sunday school? Okay, some of us old folks raised our hands. And the flannel graph had a cloud, and they would put Jesus up on the flannel graph, and he's coming back in a cloud. And when I was a little boy laying in my backyard, I used to see that cloud, and I used to wonder, is Jesus coming back on that cloud? Oh, come. Is there anybody that's still watching for the Lord? Is there anybody you're driving down the freeway, and all of a sudden you see the sun come bursting through the clouds, and you say, oh, God, there's coming a day when Jesus is going to be on that cloud. You watch and you wait for His appearing. Amen. According to 2 Peter verse 3, it tells us this. You ought to live holy and godly lives. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, are we looking forward to that? Amen. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. You're waiting for Him to come. When I'm waiting for my sweet wife to come, I got her attention now. Hey, babe, how you doing? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for her to come. I'm listening for the door. I'm listening for her to pull up in her car. Why? Because I'm looking forward to her appearing. Hello? And let me tell you something. If you're looking for Jesus, that's the kind of anticipation that you've got to have. Amen? Amen. And then lastly, we've got to tell everybody that we can. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Let me tell you something. There's a message we've got to get out. Do you realize today, stop and think about this, that every single one of you are in the same exact position as Noah? You have been divinely warned of things that are coming. And let me tell you something. You've got to get the message out to everybody that you know. You've got to tell everyone. You say how to say every single day, man, Jesus Christ is going to come back. I want you to be ready. Amen. Tell them it. Preach about it. Talk about it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for just letting me preach today. Amen. Tell everyone that you can. Would you stand with me today? Amen. Our praise team is going to come. And I'd like to ask.